tonight I have the distinction of interviewing Dr. Lourdes Torres. And we'll go ahead and begin a few questions. So please tell us where you grew up and a bit about your family. Well, first, thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming. It's my pleasure. Um, so I grew up in the South Bronx in New York City. Uh, my parents uh, were immigrants from Puerto Rico, and they came to the United States to better themselves, get better jobs. And so I was raised in the, um, the South Bronx, New York community um, during the 70s. Well, please tell us a little bit about the Bronx in the 1970s, because history tells us that it was quite a place. But in our preliminary interviews for this, you indicated you loved your neighborhood. As always, even in the midst of negative issues and crime, there's also good things that happen. And when I think about the neighborhood, I think of the, the people that were around me, my family, my friends, the, the people I went to school with, and they were all wonderful people. And um, I uh, loved being on the streets, being on the fire escape, um, hanging out with my friends. It was a, I, I remember it as a very positive, very wonderful childhood. So uh, I think uh, people uh, need to challenge those stereotypes they have about what a ghetto is or what a poor neighborhood is and recognize that it's complex. It's not just negativity, but also a lot of good things come out of those areas. What about New York City do you love? Well, New York for me, growing up as a kid, was a wonderful place. There were people from all over the world in, in my small space. There was uh, a lot of cultural events, music. There was uh, transportation. I could take trains to, the, to Manhattan, to other parts of the city. So for a kid growing up, I think it's a wonderful place. It was for me. There were many opportunities to meet people, many activities to engage in. And um, I remember it, it very fondly. Tell us a little bit about some of the activities you enjoyed at that time around New York City. Um, well, I, was, um, I went to a, a Catholic school, and so a lot of my activities as a child revolved around that school. And I remember we had very wonderful teachers and nuns who would take us on trips, would take us bowling, would take us to musical events in. Um, in, in Manhattan would take us uh, ice skating in uh, um, Rockefeller Center, would take us to St. Patrick's Cathedral, so uh, would take us to the museum. So I got a really wonderful uh, introduction to culture through the school. What happened when you were 15? Uh, when I was 15, my parents moved us out of New York City. Like a lot of immigrants, my father's dream was always to get a little house in the suburbs and move us out of the ghetto. For them, for my parents, they experienced the neighborhood as dangerous for us. So my parents were always working many jobs to raise money to get us out of there. And when I was 15, we did. We moved to Long Island. Uh, we moved to the suburbs. And uh, I remember my parents were very happy about that. And I remember being devastated because we were leaving um, the city, leaving my friends, leaving the community that I loved. And it was a difficult transition to move from the city to, as far as I was concerned, the country, uh, where there wasn't any transportation. It was very difficult to get around, where the majority of the people were white. And that was a very new experience for me in the neighborhood I grew up in. It was mostly Puerto Ricans and African Americans. So it was a huge change to go to a context where uh, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me in the neighborhood. So it was difficult. I haven't forgiven my parents yet for taking me. <laughs> Although I understand their motivation and appreciate it. How did your love of learning come about? I think it came about because of the, the education I got in um, the Catholic school, St. Luke's, where I did my grammar school years first grade to eighth grade. Um, people always have horror stories about the nuns that they um, uh, interacted with in school, but I remember the nuns as being wonderful. They were uh, mostly all um, Irish, Italian, German nuns, very uh, old, 
and um, they were just so loving and wonderful to us ghetto kids, all Puerto Ricans and black kids, the, the kids in the school. They just showed us so much love and um, they really instilled in us a love of learning, a love of literature, a love of information. And um, uh, so I, whenever people knock nuns, I get very defensive because I think they're wonderful people and I certainly had a wonderful experience with them. In speaking of the nuns, how did the nuns in your school justify their contention <clears throat> Excuse me. How did the nuns in your school justify their contention that homosexuality is wrong? And how did you respond to that? Well, they did bring that up actually in a religion class. And I remember specific conversations I had with the nuns uh, around that issue. And um, even as a child, I, I remember questioning them around this, not understanding because in the context of all these discussions about God being love and uh, how we all had to love one another, there was this very different message uh, condemning homosexuality, condemning people who had same-sex relationships. And I, I remember asking, continuing to ask, why? Why is this wrong? Why is this wrong? And I remember one nun told me, explained to me that if you look at it biologically, it doesn't work. And that if you look at um, uh, the human body, um, same-sex bodies don't fit together. And I remember being very confused about that, not quite understanding what she was getting <laughs> when she was saying they don't fit together. But um, I think I, I, I never accepted that. I, um, although I was very religious at the time and very much involved in the church, that never rang true to me. It didn't feel right that um, a certain type of love would be condemned by this God that I kept hearing about as being very loving and uh, very embracing of difference. So I just never accepted it and I kept questioning it. And uh, the nuns weren't happy about that, but they, um, you know, they gave me their explanations and I nodded and didn't accept them. You know, one of the reasons people uh, tell me why they had a, a bad experience in Catholic school growing up queer and, um, was because they were made to feel shame around their sexuality. And even though I'm one of those people who has always believed that I was born gay, and I don't remember a time when I didn't think that or believe that I was gay, I never, I don't remember ever feeling shame about it. And uh, even though I was educated in a Catholic school and was part of that religion and absolutely um, was committed to, to Catholicism, I, I don't remember feeling shame about my sexuality. I knew it was uh, not accepted and I knew that I couldn't share with people, my family, my friends, my, my school friends, that I felt that I was gay that was not acceptable. I, but I, on the other hand, I didn't think that that meant that there was something wrong with me, that I was a sinner or that um, um, I should be ashamed. I just felt it was a contradiction that I didn't understand and I, that I hoped that as I got older, I would make sense of all of that. It didn't, I, it just never occurred to me to feel bad about my feelings. Well, what opinions have you about the church's stance on birth control, the role of women in the church, the general hierarchy, things like that? Well, I think that the hierarchy is different than the church. For me, when I think about it now, I think there's the institution of the church, there's the, the hierarchy, the, the patriarchal church, the, the men who run it primarily, what they believe, and then there's what people believe. For example, the church, is against uh, the use of contraception. Forget about abortion, they're also against just contraception. <laughs> and if you ask, you know, and people have done surveys of, of Catholics, about 80% of them don't follow that. So there's the rules of the church and then there's what Catholics and people believe. And then there's also, um, I think there's uh, different factions of the church and there are those who are more committed to social justice and to change and who are committed to helping and working with poor people and people in need. 
and that that's not what the hierarchy is interested in. So I, I think we should ignore the hierarchy <laughs> and, you know, uh, listen to the nuns on the bus. Tell us, who were the nuns on the bus? The nuns on the bus were, I don't know if you've heard about them, they, they were a group in the summer of nuns, Catholic nuns, who were really offended by the proposals that the Republicans were um, uh, making in terms of the federal budget. Paul Ryan and his people, when they came out with their idea about what the federal budget should look like. And they thought it was horribly wrong, and they were tired of um, listening to politicians, especially in this uh, uh, campaign cycle. Everyone's talking about the middle class and how we have to look out for the middle class. Well, they were saying that a whole group of people, probably the majority of people, were being left out of these conversations, people who were working class, people who were poor, and they wanted to go out and do give that message. So these 10 nuns went on a 30,000-mile um, trip to different cities in the United States, and they would stop at soup kitchens, and they would stop at um, homeless shelters and congressional offices and they would have protest marches. But it was wonderful because they, they stopped in Chicago as well, and they would be greeted by huge um, groups of people who treated them like rock stars, and they'd have you know t-shirts saying, I love the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> but what they were trying to do was get out that message that um, all these debates and discussions we're having were wrong-headed and that we really needed to be talking about how we were going to address problems of poverty, of homelessness, of the fact that so many more people are having to have their meals at soup kitchens, that this is affecting, the economic situation is affecting so many people, and no one's talking about that. And so I think they did a great job of uh, going around and getting that message out. And they were also doing this against the wishes of the hierarchy, which um, uh, got um, when you got really negative about the nuns, uh, they were claiming that the nuns were speaking about things that they shouldn't be talking about mm -hmm. because they also were um, came out against uh, the Republicans when they were critiquing uh, reproductive rights for women. They went against the hierarchy by claiming that women did have a right to reproductive um, rights and to um, uh, abortion things that the hierarchy is absolutely um, against. So once again, nuns rule there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit about your coming out process. Well, as I said, I uh, have always known that I was queer, uh, even as a kid, although I also knew that I couldn't talk about it. And um, I was thinking about that today, um, what I, where I was getting information. I remember as a kid going to the Mott Haven Library in the, in the Bronx with my mother and picking out queer books, which I don't know why they let me take out. But they were <laughs> books for adults. I remember one of the first books I read when I was in seventh or eighth grade was um, this book called the, the Lord Wouldn't Mind by Gordon Merrick. It's a, um, it was a, a bestseller in the 70s, but it was about these two gay guys who uh, get in, uh, to, to, they were in college and they fall in love and one of them feels bad about being queer and the other one wants to have a relationship. But I remember reading things like that, all of the, 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 the material I came in contact with and basically dealt with gay men. I never had access to anything about women. But I loved the stuff about gay men. It seemed like to um, validate that there was a life out there possible for me someday. So I remember reading books like that. I remember seeing movies like um, That Certain Summer with Martin Sheen and Hal Holbrook. Yes. It was a made-for-TV movie about uh, um, a divorced father and his son comes home and finds out that his dad is gay and how they deal with that. So I, I think I, um, I learned about gay, being gay through gay male culture that was available to me in, in the Bronx. <laughs> and once I moved to Long Island, I, um, I was older, I was in my teens, and I discovered gay bars. 
and discos. Uh, even though I was a kid, I, I would be able to get into the bars. I had a fake ID and uh, I would get into the bars and there I learned about a whole nother world of um, gay people and lesbians and good music. <laughs> and um, I think that's how I came into a, more of a gay and lesbian culture. Speaking of music a little bit, you alluded to loving disco. Please tell us a bit about that. Who are your favorite oh, disco divas? Oh, my favorite at that time. Donna Summers and the Village People, Gloria Gaynor, um, the Bee Gees. Uh, I, still, I still think that's the best music out there. Oh, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> you visited Fire Island in the 70s after coming out. Please tell us about that. Fire Island... Um, Cherry Grove and the Pines. Um, have you ever been? Yeah. Wonderful uh, place out. Uh, it's a, a small island off of um, uh, the South Shore in Long Island, and it's a, a, a summer tourist community for gay people. Um, it is in the summer, wall-to-wall -wall gay people. There's huge discos and restaurants and a lot of people coming in from New York City to party, basically. It's just to go and you have a good time. There's a nude beach where um, people run around naked and <laughs> uh, just a good time. It's very diverse, uh, people from all walks of life and um, um, all cultures come because it's a place where people can be free and hang out. They were, it's the first place I went uh, where I saw drag shows and um, just a, a really open, kind of free um, uh, place for, for gay people. And it's still going strong every now and then. I, I still go out there uh, and uh, the discos have changed, the names have changed, but uh, and the music unfortunately. <laughs> has changed, but it's still the same kind of open space for um, gay people to go and feel like there is a place where they can be surrounded by gay and lesbian people and just have a good time and feel free. Tell us about Common Differences. Uh, Common Differences was a conference I was involved in organizing as a grad student. I, um, I went to uh, graduate school in Champaign-Urbana and uh, it's basically where I became politicized as a feminist and uh, as a lesbian activist. And one of the first things that I was able to get involved with was this Common Differences Conference that took place in 1982. And I still remember it as a very wonderful thing because it was put together by students, by graduate students and um, there wasn't a lot of support by the adults for this. What we wanted to do was bring together women from all over the world to have a discussion about our similarities and our differences across cultures, across classes, across races. And we were able to do this. We were able to get grants, to get funding, and we put together this conference that brought together over 2,000 women for a conference of uh, a week. And we had people coming from Africa, from Latin America, from all over the United States. And we had a really wonderful discussion around the differences and the similarities of women. Is there a third world women's movement? What's the um, connection between feminists of the first world, white women, and women from other parts of the world, from Latin America, from, from Africa? It was interesting. It was also the 80s. Uh, I, my, one of my roles was to bring in Latinas to this conference. And um, I brought a lot of women who were lesbians, actually. Cherie Moraga, Gloria Ansaldua, Juanita Ramos, who are these activist Latina women. And one of the conflicts at the conference was around some of the women from Latin America and other countries who did not want to hear uh, a Latinas talking about sexuality. The idea that sexuality was a feminist issue was not on the table yet. So people thought that by bringing up the right to sexuality, uh, the right to lesbianism, that it was kind of insulting for other women who were 
struggling around issues of violence or around issues of uh, poverty, that the discussion of sexuality had no place there. Since then, we've moved to a different space where now we see the connection between all of these uh, different types of oppression and we see how they are interlinked and that we need to fight them simultaneously. But at that point, it was a very contentious issue. It was a wonderful space. There were lots of arguments and heated the debates, but there was also, uh, I think, uh, places of understanding. And we were able to put together a book following the conference that gathered um, some of these discussions and, and disagreements. And the book is called The Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism. And it's, uh, I think, still relevant. People still read it to understand the development of a third world feminism through the 80s and 90s. Well, what does the term feminism mean to you? How do you define that? Well, I think feminism is, a, is about um, understanding the, that the women have an in inherent value and that um, are entitled to, to, to human dignity. And so feminism is about struggling for equality for women so that women have equal access to resources, to education, to economic opportunities. I think that uh, a lot of people nowadays feel that feminism is a thing of the past. They're, they're, it's a struggle that's been won. And I think that that's not the case. Uh, if we think about it, uh, sexism is still alive and well, and we can find it everywhere. Um, we, if we just think about the fact that today, just across any type of job or, or field, women still make 75 cents to every dollar that men make. Perhaps that's the clearest indication that there's still work to be done and that uh, some people don't uh, understand that uh, sexism like racism is part of the culture that we live in. It's everywhere. It's in all of the institutions. So we learn it in our families. We learn it at school. We learn it in our churches. And so it's become so normalized that we don't even see it anymore. And um, that's what happens when these things become institutionalized. They become normalized, they become part of everyday life, and you really have to struggle to see it, to argue against it. So I think that's our challenge, to see it, to name it, and to, to, to fight it. Do you think there will come a time when women and men are on par economically? I hope so. I probably won't live to see that, <laughs> but maybe some of you will. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, um, I mean, you think about places, um, I work at um, uh, Nepal University, you know, a Catholic institution, but very progressive, and there, like in all universities, men still make more than women do. They still make, you know, women make 75 cents to every dollar that men make, even at supposedly learned institutions where, you know, we think that uh, we've come such a long way, you still have those same issues. Tell us a bit about your professional work. Um, well, I'm a professor at uh, DePaul University, and I, I love what I do. I teach courses in Latin American and Latino studies and LGBTQ studies, and I do research uh, I run a journal called Latino Studies, and I research in the areas of uh, LGBTQ issues, uh, uh, linguistics, I study Spanish language in Chicago, and I do uh, literary analyses of literature of Latinos and queers, and a project that I took on uh, about five or six years ago that I'm very excited about is a history project. I am writing the history of Latina lesbian organizing in Chicago. And so that's a, a very exciting project that I undertook when I was, I've been a member of um, uh, one of the organizations that deals with Latinos in Chicago called Amigas Latinas. It's an organization that advocates for Latina, lesbian, bisexual, queer women. 
and it's been around uh, since 1995. Um, I joined the group when I moved to Chicago in, in uh, 1999, and I was very grateful for the fact that an organization existed that uh, tried to bridge these two communities, the Latino community and the lesbian community, the, um, the queer community, and uh, there was nothing like that that, uh, that I knew of. Um, until uh, some friends told me about Amigas Latinas. I joined up and immediately found a great community of women who were uh, not only provided a support group for Latinas, but also were interested in educating both the Latino community and the LGBTQ mainstream community about how these issues of being queer and being Latino work together and why people need to pay attention to that. So I um, participated for five or six years, and then I was asked to join the board of Amigas Latinas, and I was very happy to do so. I joined the board. I was on the board for about four years. I was president for one year. And I, was, I really loved the work of the organization. Um, we uh, not only provided a safe space for women, for Latinas, to learn about ourselves, but also we educated other communities. So we took it as our job to educate the uh, Latino straight community about the fact that Latino queers existed within the community and that they needed to embrace us and love us and recognize our contribution. We also were educating the uh, LGBTQ mainstream community that Latinos were part of the queer community and we expected the LGBT community, the leaders, the, the Center on Halstead, and other institutions that uh, claimed to speak for queer people that they needed to address the issues of the Latino queers as well. Absolutely. So it was wonderful work educating. We educated social workers who dealt with uh, Latinas about Latina queer issues. We went to schools and talked to students and um, uh, educators about Latino queer issues. So it, it developed as a support group, but it moved to become an advocacy group for queers. Anytime there was uh, issues with the Latino community uh, where uh, Latino queers were being discriminated against or were having some kind of issues, the organization stood up and defended this community and spoke out against any of these um, injustices. So after working with the community for a number of years, I decided that I needed to document the fact that this organization existed. I was actually reading about other organizations in Los Angeles, in New York, but I didn't find any information on Latinos in the Midwest who were queer activists. And I felt that there was a real gap in the history of queer organizing in the United States. And I decided that I, since I'm uh, a researcher, that it was, it was my job to research this community and to get the word out, get the story out that this community was active, that there were leaders within the community, and that they were doing good work. So I started uh, uh, interviewing uh, the leaders and members of the group and um, through that work, actually, I learned about another group that existed before Amigas Latinas. There was a group called YENA, which means, uh, or it's an acronym for Latina Lesbians en Nuestro Ambiente, which means uh, Latina Lesbians in Our Space. And this was the first group that I've been able to identify that organized in the 80s around um, queer Latino issues. And I tracked down some of the women from that group. I conducted oral interviews with them. I collected from both of the group their, um, their archives, their newsletters, the flyers for events. Um, I have programs from their activities. The, um, they did a lot of, both groups did a lot of cultural activities, brought in uh, writers, did political activities um, over the years. So I think it's important to document that history, the fact that these uh, women have been doing this work. 
and um, it, if we don't document it, it just be, it, it's forgotten, and um, it's uh, unfortunate for young Latinos growing up now who are looking for leaders and looking to see where the community has been. I think that that story that these women were out there, that they were uh, women from all different Latino backgrounds. They were Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Salvadorans, Ecuadorans. They were people who were bilingual. They were people who only spoke Spanish, only spoke English. Uh, a, a community very diverse. When people talk, think about Latinos, they think it's a monolithic group. But actually, it's very diverse in terms of nationalities, in terms of races, in terms of uh, education, um, uh, class. And what I think is really cool about both of these organizations is that they were able to bridge all of those differences. That the things that brought them together, the fact that the women involved were queer, and that they were uh, Latina, that that was enough to create a bond and uh, to start working around some of the other differences that the group had. And I think that it's a great model for organizing, actually, because not only did they um, um, organize the Latinas of many different nationalities, they also worked to form coalitions with other groups. So they formed coalitions with African-American groups, with uh, Latino men, with uh, Anglo mainstream organizations in order to get things done. So I'm, I'm working, I've published a few things on the organizations and I'm hoping to continue to publish and get the word out and make sure that that history is maintained and that it offers um, information and uh, energy to young activists who are interested in, in continuing that work. Wonderful. Well, shifting gears a little bit, tomorrow is the dedication of Chicago's Legacy Walk. What's your connection to that? I'm very excited about that and I'll be there tomorrow because um, the community was invited to nominate people who would be a part of this Legacy Walk and hundreds of people were nominated. And for the initial cohort that's going to be um, unveiled tomorrow, eight people were chosen. And one of those is the person I nominated, who is um, Antonio, Antonia Pantoja. She's a Puerto Rican educator. She is this woman who in the 70s, 80s, 90s was a fierce advocate for the education of Latino children. She founded a number of education, uh, of uh, organizations such as ASPIRA, which uh, organizations dedicated to educating poor and uh, working class Latino children. Uh, so she did this work. She was also very active around uh, other political issues like the independence of Puerto Rico. She was uh, critical of the U.S. support of the wars in Central America. She was involved in a range of issues throughout her whole life. She was born in the 30s and she died in 2002. And I discovered her work, um, I mean, I always knew growing up because I, I participated in programs that she had built, like ASPIDA. And I uh, was fascinated with her. I read her autobiography, and I read, and she had a few lines that indicated that she was queer. And I had never heard that this woman was such a, a strong, powerful um, activist and important person in my community, in the Puerto Rican community. I had never suspected that she was queer. But there, a few lines in her autobiography, she does mention that she had relationships with women and that, that it was why she didn't pursue a career in politics. Because people were also always saying to her, Antonia, you should run for office, you know, you should run for Congress, you should do something politically, because she was such a great leader. And she said that she knew that because she, um, in her autobiography, she states that because she had been in relationships with women, that she could never run for office, because all of that would come out. And so I thought that, uh, and I wrote about this, about what a tragedy it was that somebody was such an important, powerful woman within the Latino community and did so much around all these different causes that such a central part of her life had to be remain hidden. 
and that it wasn't until she was almost 80, and she had the guts, actually, I think it was very brave to write this and to essentially come out when she was almost 80 in a, in a book. And so I nominated her for the Legacy Walk, and I was really excited when she became one of the first people, when, uh, one of the people in the first cohort to be recognized. So I'm really excited because tomorrow there's going to be this unveiling of, of the Legacy Walk, and um, one of the uh, invited guests is her partner, who's still alive, uh, Wilhelmina Perry, who's in her 80s, oh. and is coming for this, and so I'm very excited. I've never, I've never met Antonia, I've never met her, Wilhelmina Perry, so I'm, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to meet her tomorrow. She's come in especially from, for this, from New York. She was so pleased to hear that her partner was being recognized in this way, and she's flying in to be a part of the ceremony. How absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's really great. What's been your greatest challenge? My greatest challenge? Well, these days, my greatest challenge is finding enough time to do all the things <laughs> that I want to do. I have so many projects, so I want to write this book about the queer uh, Latina lesbian organizing. I have commitments to the Latino community, projects that I'm doing. I run a department uh, at the Paul University. I run a journal, and there's just never enough time to do the things that we all you know, would love to do. There's so many causes, so many um, things pulling at us that I just wish there were more hours in, in the day to, to do more. What's the biggest misconception about you? Um, I think people think that I'm very quiet, and I tend to, I am I'm, uh, pretty uh, even keel, but I am very loud and aggressive when I feel that there's an injustice being committed and around me, and that I, I feel that I need to speak out, and I do. I make a lot of noise and try to make a difference when I see injustices around me. So I look like a quiet little Puerto Rican, but I can I can be pretty loud. When was the last time you had to speak out about <laughs> injustice? Oh, I think that uh, um, um, I think there's that there's an issue at school all the time where I feel that students are not being treated right or that um, issues are being ignored. Uh, for example, uh, right now, I, I think that our universities, mine included, needs to be doing more around undocumented students. There's a lot of students, uh, kids who are out there who are undocumented, who are, don't have an opportunity to get an education, don't have access to um, financial aid because they don't have social security numbers, they're not citizens, and I think this is an injustice. And I think that schools such as mine, which are committed to social justice, need to do more to ensure that students, uh, undocumented students, have a right to an education and that we need to be advocating to change their status so that they have the same rights as, as other children and other young people who want to get an education. Do you think that day will come? I do think that day will come in my lifetime. I think that there's a lot of activism now Right now, a lot of undocumented students have come out of the closet. They've come out as undocumented, and they're um, making their presence known and uh, telling the society that they've been a part of our culture, of our, uh, of our schools, and that they deserve uh, opportunities and access to education just like everybody else. And um, I think that will happen. I think that will happen. Well, Dr. Torres, I would like to thank you very much for a wonderful interview. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and thank those of you who came for coming.